working on my seeds pop up. I know we're good to go. So many recording devices I have going to make sure that we we have all this goodness saved for people. Next recording. And then the last one that we bring in is Zoom. All right, so we're about to go live on Zoom as well, okay? All right, welcome back everyone. We took a little bit of a break. We are into our last two segments of our Championing Over Violence Summit. And that's brought to you by the Women's Institute for Trauma Survivors International. We have with us today, Ms. Anatu Ben Lawal, and she was born in the beautiful country of Ghana in Africa. Anatu Benawal is a C-suite executive of SIA, the Social Innovation Africa organization that works to secure food security, agribusiness, climate change, social entrepreneurship, health, gender, and child protection. Aside from leading Social Innovation Africa, she currently also holds the Women's Empowerment and Livelihoods Initiative in Ghana and Senegal, which is geared at creating female social enterprises in aromatherapy and the food sectors as a response to increasing livelihoods and addressing sexual and gender-based violence post-COVID. SIA is a social enterprise enabler and think tank that is focused on researching and driving the enabling policy environment that will leapfrog Africa into the fourth industrial revolution. She is also <laughs> a polyglot who speaks five languages. This brilliant woman has been an enterprise business development practitioner for over 20 years, creating SME solutions across 15 African countries. Ms. Anatu has worked extensively with many NGOs such as Water Aid and Action Aid, The Hunger Project, and multinationals such as DFID and USAID. Anatu's other skills include people management, problem implementation, resource mobilization skills, communication and marketing, donor contracts, public engagement, community mobilization, advocacy, networking, strategic management, facilitation. She is an educator and an effective team player. Ooh, that was a lot. I also have, <laughs> she also has extensive managing and experience motivating teams throughout her entire career and has developed an amazing toolkit of resource mobilization, organization development, monitoring and evaluation for the African sector. I give you Ms. Anatu Ben Luang. <laughs> Hello, my dear. Hello, everybody. Good to be here, finally. <laughs> yes, finally. So I lassoed Miss Ben Lawal into this, <laughs> and I know she is quite tired. She is always working, and <laughs> I feel like she has five jobs for five different organizations. <laughs> so it is amazing that and it is it is nighttime for you there, because isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's already late and probably past her bedtime. So we are, <laughs> we are very grateful that we have her here in this room. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, and um, intersex individuals also who may be um, listening in, non-binary folks as well. We love you too. Um, just want to let you know that the reason why I admire this woman so much 
is because when she found out about what I was aiming to do with this organization, she began to tell me of some of her experiences. And the fact that she could hold her own and continue to be so strong and warrior driven amidst some of the very, very um, insurmountable issues throughout Africa is what helps me to recognize we need to all keep pressing forward. So tell us what you'd like us to know about your region of the world. I know that you've worked, of course, in your home country of Ghana. I know that I also spoke to you while you were working in Tanzania. I have also spoken to you while you were working in Senegal. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, where was, where was the other place that you were? We, was it in Sudan? And I said, wait a minute, this lady is working in all these countries. So please tell us, what is it that you do around aiding women and children throughout um, the, your region of, of Africa? Okay. with regard to, I know one of the things we talked about was female, female genital mutilation, okay? We also talked about gender-based violence, you know, and aiding women, particularly in rural communities around elevating themselves economically. So this is meant to be a discussion. And if anybody has questions, feel free to, um, are you open to them either dropping it into the chat or unmiking and asking questions? Anatu? Yes. yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. So it'll be a well rounded conversation. Feel free to chime in, anyone, and um, just tell us about some of the work that you've been doing, some of the challenges, and then we can talk solutions after you share with us some of the challenges in your work. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh... Laurel, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's always a pleasure for us to talk about Africa, our continent, who we all love, whether black or white, wherever you come from, I know that there's a great love for Africa. There's been a lot of tragedy, but everybody recognizes the talent and the greatness of our continent. And I am proud to be part of it. I have always, uh, I started off being a young person and trying to figure out like, most of you, you know, why is Africa poor? Why is Asia poor? Why are some countries third world countries? Why are some countries rich? And the usual questions. And trying to understand what is my role in it. So um, I studied, uh, I lived in Africa till I was about uh, 16. Then I went to the West and I was there for roughly about uh, 18 years. And then I moved back, I think about 15 years ago. But the reason why I moved back, and this is going to sound a little bit strange, but let me get a little deep. I had a, a vision, so to speak, and uh, I felt like it was time for me to come home. Um, so when I came home, I moved back. I moved back with one suitcase, and it was, it was such a powerful vision. I moved one suitcase, I think 600 or 700 uh, pounds. I gave away everything, and I came home, and I moved to a village called El Elmina, which is where the first slave port was, the castle. And stuff like that. and just really working at the rural area and trying to understand dynamics and it was hard it wasn't easy i wouldn't lie but i was there for two years and i stuck it out but i saw the need to also move my mom said to me why don't you move in town meet other people and get the message across instead of being stationed there so i did that um, and I, it was worth it uh, and i'm glad for that experience that it gave me but since then i've just been going into different i've stayed in the humanitarian sector and I've sort of uh, worked my way through whether it's water and sanitation, whether it's gender, whether it is drought, whether it's climate change, etc. but always with a uh, woman at the center. Then I think about after a number of years of working in development and getting grants and executing, I realized they were not as effective because I don't think that anybody can really grow on an aid based model. Because first of all, it starts off with an unequal, uh, what should I say? Uh, you, you start off unequal. So the person who's giving the money is dictating how your development should be and how they di dictate that and what they want is not necessarily what is needed. But on the other hand, you need the money, right? So you say yes to that. So there's been a lot of reasons why so much money has been pumped into aid and 
apparently nothing much has come out of it and that's a whole other philosophy to talk about but to that to the point it was that i was in sierra leone i was working on fgm a few years ago and i had a vision and we're remembering victims of war and i had a vision about women and millions of women walking up to me in this vision everybody thought it was a candlelit vision so nobody could see what's happening to me all these women coming and saying what happened to them the trauma they had undergone they mm -hmm. had been killed and during the war some of them had had their stomach split open and they had been raped. And FGM, 97% uh, of women in Sierra Leone have had female undergone circumcision and all these things. Then I moved to Congo, I went to the DRC and I was working with war zone rape victims, et cetera, et cetera. But the final quest was having that vision again, it came to me one morning and I knew that my life work was to work with women. And so that is what led me to Northern Ghana where there's a lot of, uh, so many different issues and there are so many tribes there but what i realized that really got my goods aside from fgm was the issue of unpaid domestic work and so you have women who are basically domestic slaves and it's a whole system and it's been around for a very long time and these women are from a very young age betrothed to these older men and they at the age of 15 they go off and they uh, somehow become their chattels they don't go to school they have to give birth to six seven eight nine ten children who then become slaves for this man. And uh, that, that is really my passion now to see that overturn and for domestic slavery to stop being an issue here. And I think it can be done through legislation and several things. So one of the things we're doing is trying to create a feminist forum so that to, to drive the advocacy and then also look at uh, especially agribusiness and various livelihood initiatives that uh, can support these women into making their own money. And I think, um, COVID and the results of uh, COVID, uh, what's happening in the pandemic has had a lot of um, impact on Africa, but some of the things that people don't look at are the rates at which incest has risen. It has really been a spike in some of these communities uh, because as we know, schools and other agencies provide a, a, a form of refuge from some of these uh, violators and uh, the, the, the results have really gone through the roof. We just released a, a, a research on that and also, looking at the fact that aid has then also finished, it's dwindling. And so now we have the problem of like, what are these communities going to do? But at the same time, you have incredible poverty and then you have incredible need. And that is where social innovation, Africa is looking to look at various partnerships and other ways of creating wealth on the continent in order for us to be able to support our own initiatives, support our own healing, our own therapy and the rest. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Okay. That was a mouthful, and I hope everybody got that on Facebook. <laughs> um, so let's just slow the pace a little bit and unpack all of that. So okay. for, those, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the acronyms, when we say FGM, we're talking about female genital mutilation, which is a practice um, that has been around for really thousands of years. And in many places, even after legislation has gone through to um, prohibit the continuance of FGM, for example, in the country of Sudan, um, it continues for various um, cultural reasons. And that was one of the things that I know that I've spoken with Ms. Anatu about at length and how that impacts so much of a woman's life because it essentially starts with this kind of really heinous trauma. So let's, let's just talk from the beginning. So everybody kind of gets the scope of what you're talking about here, okay? You said 97% of the population, this is done to the woman, correct? Yes. Okay. So 97% of the population, how old are these young women when this is done to them? Usually it starts from, for some it's very early, um, almost, uh, I'll say two to three years old. And, but there's a specific ceremony that happens at around the age of 15, 16 when they are now seen as uh, teenagers and it's an initiation into womanhood and uh, performing the FGM is part of that uh, ritual. Okay, so it can start as young as two or three years old. And yes. 
just so that people who, again, are looking at this understand, help them to understand the conditions under which this is done. Mm -hmm. um, from what I you have shared and I have read, this is done without anesthesia. It is essentially a surgery that is performed without anesthesia and is also performed with crude tools, many times unsterilized, is that correct? By individuals yes. who do not have medical training. Correct, okay. And, and how are the, since they, they're not anesthetized, how are they immobilized so that this really crude surgery, you know, at a point on a woman's body that actually has the most nerve endings outside of the brain and the spinal yeah. column, that is the organ that has the most nerve endings. So tell me something so sensitive, what is done to immobilize these young women? Okay, so we first of all have to understand, and I, I really didn't get this growing up and I'm trying to understand why people would perform FGM and why it continues and how can you get a whole group of people and 97% willing to do it? And first of all, the cultural conditions. So there was a queen in the 18th century who instituted it. I mean, it had been around for a long time, but she really made it popular. She was called Mami Yoko and she did a lot of good things I have to give her. And uh, she ended up committing suicide, what well, it said actually. But one of the things she did was to establish this sort of schools for girls. And that's where you learn how to grow and be proper, etc. And she also, emphasize that female genital mutilation is what made a woman a woman and that's what made her clean and that's what made her you know so what happens is that this ritual is so sacred to them it's part of a ritual and if it's not done you're extra uh, exercise from the community you don't uh, you're you can't get you're, you're put out you're put you're out, put out. You're, you're not part of it so you they actually want it you understand no matter how painful because that is when you, you know, and what we have been advocating for is that there's other good things, you know, they learn how to cook, they learn how to be clean, they learn how to, all that stuff. So do that stuff without the cutting. So the cutting is the culmination of about two weeks in the forest and they do it at night. And then you have these girls coming to do it. And it's a, it's a really traumatic for them. And a lot of girls die in the process, but even worse off is during the process, they are not allowed to scream or to struggle. And like you said, this, this I mean, the nerve endings, I'll trap this. So of course you will struggle. And they get a really heavy woman. They have a resident fat woman to sit on them to prevent them from screaming. And a lot of the time, most of the deaths are, come from choking because somebody's sitting on them as opposed to even the crude methods of operating. So it's really hellish and really traumatic for these girls. And they grew up because I remember we did a video on it. And during the video, even my colleagues who I work with, who had had these things done to them when they were two or three, had to leave the room and were really, really traumatized by it. And we're still talking about how they still ask their parents, why did you let this happen to me? So I have a question. Um, this is done by tribes or this is done by uh, somebody outside of this, the, the African community? This is done by a tribe. Now there are some tribes, I'll be honest, who don't, really practice it, but a majority of the tribes in Sierra Leone, especially the Mende tribe, practice it. That's, that, that's traumatizing. Yeah. Okay. If you have any questions, um, ladies and gentlemen in the audience on Clubhouse, feel free to back channel us as well, because we are entertaining questions at this time. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us about um, when you talk about the domestic slavery, how young are these girls? You told me a story when we spoke, you know, in preparation for you coming to deliver this address to us and share with us a lot about your work throughout Africa. You told me a story about a man meeting a woman in the village and she has a little baby girl and this man approaches the woman with her little girl child in arms and and what transpired okay it's actually um not just meeting the woman but uh, it's actually when she's born 
So when a man passes by a house when a baby is born and there's the he hears the wail of a baby's cry, could be on the day she was born or the day after, he has the right, uh, according to tradition, to enter that house and find out is it a baby girl or is it a baby boy? If it's a baby boy, then he leaves that alone. If it's a baby girl, then straight away he's uh, entitled to give a penny or anything and say he has betrothed her. And so then that means that at the age of uh, maybe from eight, nine, 10, but really around 15, he comes and she's his bride. Eight, nine, 10, and as young, okay. So as young as eight, nine, 10, up to 15 years of age, a young girl that was purchased for as little as a penny can be betrothed to a man that she had no choice. Absolutely no choice. Absolutely no choice. And tell us, kind of walk us through what you have observed happens to her after her family relinquishes her to this man. What happens to this woman? So usually the man is already married. So she comes in as the second or third wife. Mm -hmm. And she is to serve the first wife at the age of 15 and help do menial chores in the house and etc. But when they consummate the marriage and she has children, the, the real goal is to have children. And the real goal of him marrying her is to, okay, so when they get married, he gives a sack of rice or a sack of corn, and that is all she gets in the marriage. And she's supposed to multiply that. And she's supposed to have children who are to multiply and work in his fields and they don't get paid and she doesn't get anything for it except being a slave for him around after at the end of the day she can still go around four o'clock or three o'clock and go and scavenge or look for some laundry to do or some you know but really she's uh, subjected to a life of menial work in his farm and at the end of every each harvest he takes away 100 percent, gives her maybe something to buy food not even a certain percentage she's not allowed to own land so that she can even create her own farms etc and that she doesn't get anything and off he pockets the money and goes with it to do whatever he wants to do. Okay. So, Sarah Jane, I just saw that you, you came onto the video. Did you wanna ask a question? Hi. Hi, Anachu. How are Hello. you doing? <laughs> So um, I know Anatu has been in the in the vineyard toiling in Africa for a while on these issues. But what I wanted to ask is, do you feel that the organizations that are currently on the ground trying to do some of do you think they're making headway? Or do you think that there needs to be more collaboration so that the results are more tangible and sustainable? Okay. So um, I think that they, there's a lot of cross-sector, multi-sectoral approach. But always, there's always a lack of funds, which is a problem because there's, uh, it's dependent on foreign donors, which is why I started Social Innovation Africa. So we could start looking at social enterprise and other initiatives. Most of these issues are related to poverty. And so I always say to people that patriarchy continues to exist in the way it does in Africa because it is economically viable for some people. You know, we've had generations, we've had archaic beliefs, we've had all sorts of things ended and after training, et cetera. But patriarchy continues because it is beneficial to a certain group of people who are interested in maintaining it from all angles. So you have these people on the ground and they're working and they're talking, et cetera, but they're not really that empowered. You cannot be empowered when you are not doing things the way you want to do them with your own money and where you can look at culture and you can look at the real amount of time that it takes to provide the the, the, the behavioral change, which sometimes takes years, et cetera. Also, in order to criminalize some of these things, it takes finances. The political will is a big one where you can just say, why don't we just criminalize everything? But some of these things are so strong that uh, people would rather, um, they prefer the votes. So in, for instance, in Sierra Leone, if you go and challenge female genital mutilation, they will not vote for you as a political candidate. If it's something on the agenda that you want to abolish, they will not vote for you. Here in Ghana as well, and across Africa, I know domestic slavery is a big issue, and I know they're not dealing with it because uh, they know there'll be an uproar and they will not have votes. That's the reality. No matter, I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> so um, let me let me ask this question. Do you know anything in, in regards to the involvement of the United Nations in Africa? Uh, apologies, I, I, I missed the last bit. Okay, I, I was asking, um, do you know anything in regards to the involvement of the United Nations? 
within the African um, continent? Yeah, the United Nations uh, drives a lot of uh, initiatives. You have UNHCR who work along the humanitarian side, but there's only so much they can do. So they come in to you know, support refugees, do all kinds of things, feed people, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what they do. But uh, they, they, I, I guess they support in many ways, but the problems are overwhelming. I don't, I don't know if, like, I, I have extensive knowledge within the, the, the UN network, and I feel like it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fraud going on, but I, I cannot personally say I've seen what, what, what's, what's been happening in Africa, but I feel like they've been tainting food and all of that stuff just to actually gain more control over people again. But, I, I, I wouldn't dis disagree with you because I wouldn't say it's just the United Nations. I think it's just, a, it's Western society. I think it's a, a whole lot around donor dynamics and why they're in Africa and colonialism, et cetera. And that's something that yeah. critically needs to look to be looked at. So yes, the UN, but I think it's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch so, of them, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But I also think Africa does have also have to, somebody mentioned self-accountability. I don't know if it was yourself. And yeah. I think Africa- it was, um, it was a gentleman who presented before you, Mr. Gaines, Charleston Gaines. Okay. Yeah. And so whilst we look at the colonial structures and the reasons why we are here and the trauma, et cetera, there are also a lot of things that we can walk away from and do ourselves that uh, we need to also start looking at. And back again to the issue of social enterprise, social innovation, what do we have here? How can we stop this dependency on donors? How can we stop this dependency, et cetera, and stop saying, okay, yeah, we're victims and, you know, but how can we change that as well? Whilst we're having this conversation around. Um, okay. Let's, um Let's pause here to make sure that people understand why I felt the need to invite you here to this conversation, because this whole summit championing over violence is using a decolonizing trauma approach. So we're looking at trauma as it has been affected from colonialization, from patriarchy, from systems of oppression, and how all of those factors have contributed to violence um, as is experienced in modern day, because it harks back to all of those systems that are very, very old, that people do not readily acknowledge. So, and how it affects particularly indigenous, black, and people of color throughout the world. Okay, and that is why I felt, of course, you as somebody who has been in the trenches doing this work for decades throughout Africa, you had a very good comprehensive knowledge of what was going on. Here's the thing, in speaking with a doctor, and that's why I asked you the question that I asked you earlier on, he said to me, when I related some of the things that we talked about, he said, it is important, Laurel, that you get them to come on camera and tell the story because the news does not report the story like this, okay? Yeah. So we need to understand that previous question I asked because I was told to do this by a high level doctor, okay? He said, people need to understand what happens to those girls once they are married off in that home, because this is not reported in the news and this is still happening in 2021, okay? So we don't know where this is going to go, but the story needs to be told because let's face it, can those girls come here and speak with me? No. no. So <laughs> at that point, you have to be their advocate. You have to speak for them. And he said it is critically important that the story be told. And I agree with him because he's a brilliant man. So on that note, I'm going to spotlight you and I need you to tell me and the world what exactly happens to them. And I will come in just with questions um, because I really want people to hear what is happening. Now, what has happened in the past? What is currently happening right now? Please okay. tell me what happens. Okay, so the problem is so widespread that... Uh... What's happened in the past and continues to happen is these girls uh, are married. It's a system. The whole family is in support of it. 
And it's coming from the fact that the girl child has no agency. A no. woman have no agency of her own. She's not recognized as anybody at all. So usually the cycle is perpetuated because the man then dies at some point, the, aka the father, or the man who came to marry this young girl. And because so then he's he has older, older children. Because he's much older, right? She's a, she's a young girl okay. and he's much older. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. And so his daughters then get to a certain age where he dies and maybe the 12, 15, et cetera. So even if they didn't want to perpetuate that to continue, they are forced, there's a system where they are forced to get married because their brothers have no intention of having them as a burden on them. And so I ran an incubator in Northern Ghana for uh, about a hundred girls last year and this year. And I interviewed about 150 of the girls to understand their situation. So there's a system where within a month or two of getting married, they, uh, of, of, of their father or their protector or whoever is taking care of them dying, if they don't have a really strong elder sister, then she has to be married. Now the marriage is not based on love or anything. It's just based on somebody wanted a domestic slave. So they go into these marriages. And one of the things is to make sure that they serve the husband and the family. You're only a good wife if you serve the husband and the family. And so they have different tribes. So I'm talking about about a hundred tribes perpetuating this. So some of them, for some of them, uh, there's one tribe where they have to get circumcised before they get married. And if she's a good woman, then they heal quickly. quickly. If they don't heal quickly, then she's a bad wife. And different tribes have different levels of it. Some of them still do kidnap, well, you know, kidnap their wives when it comes to this. So it's really a bad situation all around. And there's not one particular, you know, but the woman is always, or the girl, what happens to her is that she is then has to spend her life in servitude. Her education has been cut short. So where's she going to go? Now, when she's doing this, that she's working in the, the farms, etc. she has to wake up really early and cook for the whole household of, I don't know, the man, his brothers, her children, etc. with very little money, because like I said, they don't give them money. And she has to do all of these things. And if she's late going to the farm, because they usually go in groups, she can get raped on the way. It's not she can get, they usually get raped on the way. Now, I, when they, she gets raped on the way, the the community really frowns on rape. And so they try to find who did that and who was the perpetrator. When he's caught, then he's fined and he has to go through all kinds of provocation, et cetera. But the, the penalty, whatever the reward or the fine is, it's not given to the girl. It goes to the chief, who is the man. Can you imagine that? You know, you get raped and somebody else is compensated. So what then happens is that then they don't come out. They don't come out to talk about it because you're ashamed Everybody knows you've been raped. You don't get any compensation. And of course, you're certainly not going to get married by anybody. So there's this culture of shame and silence. Then they continue and they have their children and already they're already depressed, you know, because I want to really see this as like a whole. And one of the things I was talking to Laurel is that for me, this is like a whole is a generation of trauma because they're despondent and they don't even know they're despondent. They know they have nowhere to go. Yeah. And these men have multiple wives and there's abuse and the, you know, and then afterwards he comes in, in the evening after a hard day's work, there's no tenderness, there's no care, and then he wants to have sex. And usually their form of sex is usually what we would describe as marital rape. Even uh -huh. if she doesn't, yes. And so this is what she goes through, you know. But it wouldn't be so bad if there was hope because if she had children and they were going to school, then she knows that somewhere the cycle will end and, you know. But that doesn't happen because these children that she has for him are also going to work in the farms. Do you understand? So without education and a lifestyle, so they also then go on to perpetrate the same thing with their wives if they are girl children because they have no source of income except they enslave their wives and cause them to you know, grow them. So it's really, really a crazy one. A lot of the women die early. I think the life expectancy is around 40, 45, especially in a place called the Volta region where we've just done a documentary. You know, and women are just, uh, it's like a, a lifetime of, uh, I don't know what to call it, uh, subjugated to just slavery. And I mentioned, I don't know if I told you about uh, one girl that we were working with recently. And what had happened to her was that at the age of eight, she was given to her brother to care for because her parents had died or they had no money, etc. And he violently abused her from every day for about four or five years. And she had three pregnancies for him. And the last one, the child was not even dead when he went to bury the child and this girl is 14 years old so you can imagine who is she going to grow up to become 
what's going to happen to her? What's going to happen to her children? What's going to happen to, you know? And this brother, once we put him in jail, but after uh, a week, social services and the police had to say, hey, if the family is not going to come and, you know, arrest him, which takes money and the courts, et cetera, then we're going to have to release him because nobody's supposed to be held. So he's out again. And if she has nowhere to go, you know, this will happen to her. So then what happened last time, and the last thing I heard was that she had, uh, um, she had gone to live with a pastor and family. We put her in, we re rehoused her, and she started going to school. Then in that house, the son also managed to get her pregnant again. So now, um, this morning I was lying in bed thinking, oh God, what is next? Wow. I know. Yes, yes. And we who have to engage, right, with these survivors and listen to their stories, you're holding space for all of that. And here you are on a Saturday needing to rest from the work week. And you're thinking about, right, just we hold their stories. We hold their stories with us, yeah? And, and you're thinking about what is going to happen to her, what is going to become of her. So I completely understand your approach. Um, it's very practical in terms of mobilizing women so that they're economically um, shored up against the societal and systemic abuses, right? Because yes. money, yes, money can be a catalyst out of this kind of environment. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, we get it. We so get what you're doing. We support you. Thank you. What are some of the things that you feel like can be done, needs to be done in the, the few minutes that we have left together? What do you think can be done? Um, okay, what, think what, what, what can an organization like mine do other than getting the message out, other than making sure that, that we give you a voice, um, if you can ever pass the mic to one of these beautiful young women to tell her own story, that would be amazing as well. And that's one of the things that I am intending to do. So okay. tell us how else we could help. What are the other things that we could do? I think it's just really doing material and running continuous campaigns on this, because I think to a certain extent, the world, there's, there are so many problems in Africa that the world, this is, uh, that does not really put the correlation together of how, for me, there's this trauma that's ongoing for these girls. The whole yeah. process of losing who you are, of even being born. And how can we challenge that and say, hey, to lawmakers and to government and embarrass them, so to speak, and say, hey, you have the system going on in your countries, because it's not only just one country. I can guarantee you this happens in every African country at a different level. So what are you doing about this? And we need to put some of these governments to, 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 to shame and, and, you know, and put pressure on them. And so for me, it's a campaign, it's materials. I would say even resources, because I believe resources come when, you know, you get a message out and people, the right people hear it, but it's really understanding and taking on brush and say, no, this has to stop. That's true. My question is, how could we work towards the eradication of um, governments around the world? I feel like they they actually not needed for us to um for us to, to, to survive and to get along. Mm. I agree, um, but at, at the moment, unfortunately, we have to use them because they are the people who are in charge, and they are the ones who you know. If the president stands up or uh, one of his uh, ministers or the minister of women, and they say no, we are going to focus for the next five years on eradicating this. It can be done. Yeah. People make things sound so complicated as if it's going to take millions or whatever it is. Criminalize it. I mean, Criminalize I know, it. Allow the woman to own land. Allow her to, you know, even if you don't give her anything, stop her from being uh, subjected to slavery. All, all I'm saying is I know I know America has a huge hand. America has a, the American government itself has a huge hand in Africa. And they, they have a huge hand in, you know, installing agents and government all around the world. But who am I? Yeah. Well, we, we know about a lot of those... Um, things that are happening um, underground, behind the scenes, and puppeteering situations. Mm. However, just to re keep focus here, I want to, what has been in the back of my mind and now is my, in my prefrontal cortex, I just need to ask you, 
by speaking these things honestly, frankly, openly, could you possibly be in danger? Oh, yes. Um, I'm not in Sierra Leone now, thank God. But yeah, in, when I was in Sierra Leone, we needed protection regularly because the, uh, yeah, because it's really like going against the, you know, in Northern Ghana, not so much at this level, but going forward, I think if I, it, 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 when I take it up as a national issue, for now it's so, oh, yeah, not is just the speaking, et cetera. But when it turns to an actual movement, uh, which is looking at land ownership, which is looking at economic empowerment of women, et cetera, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to, uh, that, that's going to happen. And, uh, okay. No two ways have, about it. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. I have a question for Natu. And Natu, yes. you've been doing this work for you've been doing this work for such a long time, um, mm. and you're very passionate about it. You're very passionate about taking women and girls from from the place of degradation that they're in in a lot of countries to a level of dignity and and pride in themselves and stuff like that. Um, have any of the governments acknowledge the work that you're doing and in and supported any of the work that you're doing um that's one question and the other question is in terms of you you mentioned funding earlier as well in terms of when i asked about collaborating with other NGOs, what kind of funding do you think would be necessary just to say handle just now and based on the agenda that you've just spoken about about getting this criminalized and that kind of thing um, I think uh, for the kind of uh, uh, thing that you were talking about with other agencies and in government, no, there has been no support. Um, there has been no support because, like I said, it's not a priority to government. Women are not a priority to government. And what I've been saying for a while now is that there's uh, this social feminism that needs to happen, where we as women are coming up and saying, you know what, we have purchasing power, we have all kinds of power, and we need to stop giving that power to men. We're gonna make our own funds. We are gonna create our own funds for women, for women and by women. That's what I'm talking about, you understand? And then we can also look at the type of funds that we need are unrestricted funds, because sometimes you wanna work on these issues. But on the other hand, you walk into the village and a woman is being lynched. You know, She needs that immediate support. So you kind of need money that is restricted, restricted, unrestricted at the very least to be able to make those decisions in terms of how to get them the help that they need. Because for some of them, before you're able to get them to that level, you need to take care of their basic needs. So this week I had a, uh, uh, we had a conference with uh, UNFPA and I saw some of my girls on stage and they were talking and they were explaining and I was so proud of them, but that's not where they started from. We needed to take them through some training, get them some support, get them some mental health, you know, and all those before they get to that level where they can actually be advocates themselves. And they are the better advocates because they can speak of their experience. So I think an unrestricted fund led by women, for women globally, or different types of funds like that popping up all over the place that is looking at advocacy and looking at saying, no, we're not going to allow this to continue. We're going to stop pretending that it's a non-issue. We'll just bring that to, we'll just uh, be able to open the way and pave the way. One of the things that we've done here in Ghana is uh, now education is free. And so you, now you have some level of education, but as practically what it means, when you look at societies and communities, like I said, it benefits a lot of people to keep these girls in bondage, to keep her beneath what she's supposed to be, to keep them in fear, give them no agency so they can serve them. And uh, that just needs to be stopped. That's not allowable. That's not, for me, it's, it's, it's a non-negotiator. And I'm ready to take on. And some of the things that we we what, some of the things that you were talking about support, like I said, it's not necessarily financial, but campaign materials, talking about it, getting people aware about this, and stopping this thing globally, not just in Africa, for women to be able to earn their own income and be productive and to be able to, to look after their children. Yeah, I was talking with my mic on. <laughs> and, uh, excellent, excellent points and. Exclusive was um, mentioning, of course, in the chat, some pretty radical views, one of which I actually really like, the whole system of bartering. I think that, because um, he asked specifically, are we able to trade items instead of trading money by any chance? Um, I'm wondering because of the distance between where you are and where they are, right? 
that could be that could be expensive. And I think when it there's import, aren't there import taxes as well that the receiver may have to pay? Yes, you have those. I mean, legally, uh, the government says, oh, you're, you're an NGO, you're not supposed to pay taxes, but it's not really the reality. So I like the idea of trading items, but also talents and also, you know, different opportunities and uh, some of which money can buy, you know, uh, lawyers, professionals like yourself, it's all coming in to create this movement where we are using our resources as women or as feminist men and supporting and pushing this thing for a number of years to see the end of it. I mean, I don't think, um, honestly, what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, I, I think you kind of, like, not to, not to put you in a, in, a, in a bad place, but I kind of think you misunderstood where I was going with it. If we stop using the money entirely, if one day, like, if one day we decide 24 hours, we're not using the money, I guarantee you, the stock markets around the world, when we're banking with these governments, it's going to cease to exist, trust me. And, like, we, we need to stop utilizing the money in, in general. I, I'm talking about when we're, um, actually, when, when um, the, the, the veteran was speaking earlier today, um, it's all about self-accountability and trading energy, as, as he was speaking about, because energy is a currency, right? Mindset is a currency. And what do lawyers have? A mindset. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that input. I, I know that um, that is ideally and ideologically a very lofty, amazing place if we get to where we can trade with one another, help one another without the currency of money, right? Unfortunately, we are, we are a long way off, unfortunately, um, from that happening right now. And so what we need are actionable things right now, because what I'm hearing is a whole ton of suffering happening Mm. And nobody is acknowledging it. Um, nobody, I mean, in terms of the larger global community, there's not one, perhaps a full awareness of the scope of it all. Mm. And so that is, this is the start. This is the start, right? Because yeah. we, know, we have no idea where these conversations and these ripples are going to go. And I know in terms of, of time, I am present in the time. We are about eight minutes over. I wanna thank you for giving us so generously, you know, of your time, of your energy, um, of your experience and, and the experiences of others, right? Yeah. And speaking for those who are not able to come be with us to speak for themselves, because one day I want to pass the mic and I'm gonna say, oh, I'm gonna be quiet now. I wanna hear from you. Tell yeah. us, tell everyone everything yeah. you need. I'm telling you, I'm going to be just jumping up and down with joy. The day is going to come when we pass the mic. Yes. Okay. All okay. right. Are there any final words of gratitude for Ms. Ben Lawal for anything that she shared? And we have more people um, on Clubhouse if you want to send us any messages about what Ms. Anatu Ben Lawal of Ghana and she works with women and children throughout Africa, not just in aiming to empower them, um, but also to educate them on, on their rights, their agency. And we appreciate all the work that you have done and are still doing on the ground throughout Africa. Thank you for being in the world and being a light, being a beacon. Look at that beautiful smile. <laughs> Hey, Thank Laurel, you. I would love to add to the conversation. This is Lori. Absolutely. Please do. Come on in. I, I just wanted to say um, that I feel like we should be, I love that you, you use the term because as you were describing it, and I've heard of these things before because we had some speakers uh, when I graduated college a very long time ago, um, where they came from Africa to talk about um, female like genital mutilation and things like that. And you know, uh, all the things that you talked about. And I like that you use the word of modern day, um, like slavery, because we have to call things what they are. And I think when we tiptoe around using um, language that seems uncomfortable is when allowances are made. And I think that, um, you know, I don't know if you agree with this term, but I feel like the social norm and the 
powers that be that are passing on these again i love that you use the world or the word um girl child because that's truly what they are is children um i I tended to think that it's a form of sex trafficking, you know, using girls. I don't know if they're having sex with these men because they're so old. I'm sure that it, it, it is happening because I know that um, that all of the rape that's going on, uh, it's contributing to uh, the numbers of AIDS cases. Like there's so many things that kind of play into it, but just the factor of passing along young children that are actual children haven't even reached the point of getting their periods yet um to having sex with older men to me that's trafficking and i feel like we should be using stronger terminology and call it what it is and and with that terminology brings shame to those things and over time you know a so changing social norms is a really really hard thing to do because it takes so long so i just wanted to uh kind of add those uh pieces of information of what came to mind when you were speaking Thank you. Um, Anasu, I did want to let you know that someone on the back channel from Clubhouse did express their gratitude for your sharing and what you came to share with us today. And, you know, all of this is education for people that otherwise would not know about what is happening, you know, throughout many, many uh, remote regions, rural areas, as you, you shared you know, throughout Africa. And again, so grateful for the work that you are doing in the world. I know that some of these girls are happy to see you when they see you. I know I would be <laughs> like, who is this angel? <laughs> so please continue to do what you do. Know that you're in our prayers, okay? And, and we will do as much as we can to support you. Please remain connected and let me know if you see that there's something that I can do with this organization to assist you, okay. let me know. Let's okay. let's talk about. We already started talking about the the shop, you know, and getting like jewelry done and hammered. Okay, we we already talked about that. So that is going to be in the works definitely for next year. Um, mm -hmm. So we can start rolling things out and getting some money flowing in to these young women. Okay if we're able to lasso them in that way, that would be amazing. That would make me feel like my life is fulfilled. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We need to like breathe, exhale. You've been awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, my dear. Okay, we're gonna stop the uh, recording here. We're gonna stop the